Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, listen, I know you didn't come into this place to hear from a man. I know you didn't come to hear from a woman, a tall man, a short man, a white man, a black man, a brown man, young man, old man, or a woman for any of that matter. We come into this place to hear from God, so let's do this. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get down on my knees and go before the Lord in prayer. Would you join me in standing as we go before the Lord in prayer? And let's prepare to hear the word of the Lord today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we glorify you. We thank you. God, your word says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord, because that's where we know your presence is. Lord, your word says that when two or more are gathered together, there you are in the midst of them. So, Father, we thank you that you are here today in the midst of us and your presence is here. Lord, we don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. God, we don't come to church for entertainment or tradition, but, Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So it's in the name of Jesus we ask that your Holy Spirit would minister to us, speak to us, to show us things in our lives, to plant the seed of the Word of God in our hearts and in our lives, that we could cultivate that and and pay attention to it, Lord, that it would grow and bear much fruit in our lives, that we could go out and be who you have called us to be. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us. And Lord, these blessings we don't ask upon ourselves only, but upon all the churches across the world and around the Inland Empire that are preaching and teaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for our brothers and sisters. At no time do we think ourselves as better than anybody else, but rather as co-laborers. So, Father, we ask that you bless our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Baptists and Lutheran and Episcopalian and Methodist and Presbyterian brothers and sisters. Lord, I thank you for the churches all across the Inland Empire, for Harvest and the Grove and, and Sandals and the Well and, and the Way and uh, Emmanuel Baptist, Trinity, Oak Valley, Crossroads, Ecclesia. Lord, all the churches all across the Inland Empire and all around the world. Lord, we truly see ourselves as brothers and sisters in the same body of Christ. Lord, working together to build your kingdom for your glory. And Lord, to you be the praise, glory, and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. As you're being seated, go ahead and grab your Bibles, open them up to the book of Hebrews. As we continue our study in the book of Hebrews, line upon line, precept upon precept. If you're just joining us at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center, we go line upon line, precept upon precept through the Bible, through the, through the books of the Bible. So we've been in a study of the books of Hebrew or the book of Hebrews for quite some time over the past few years. Resuming after a short break. And now we find ourselves in Hebrews in the sixth chapter. The Bible was written that way, line upon line, precept upon precept, thought upon thought. So we've been studying it that way, and now we find ourselves in Hebrews in the sixth chapter. So Hebrews in the sixth chapter today, we're going to resume in the sixth chapter, starting in verse number nine out of Hebrews. Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verse number nine says, But beloved, we are confident of better things. Concerning you, yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. I love this because here what's happening is the author of Hebrews is making a transition. Now, if you were here for the past couple of weeks, uh, a few weeks ago, Pastor Jim talked about the the middle section of the first part of Hebrews, the sixth chapter, talking about our salvation and how we can choose to walk away from from that salvation. It's a heavy message, a message of maturity, a message of deep thinking and understanding. But now the, he- the author of Hebrews turns the page and begins to turn the subject and now begins to deliver a message of encouragement. I love what he says. He says, but beloved, you see, the message of encouragement is to you and I, those in the church, those adopted into the body of Christ through salvation. Here is a message of encouragement to you and I today. So today what we're going to do is we're going to continue on in that message of encouragement, looking at Hebrews in the sixth chapter. We're going to look at the subject. He says, we are confident of better things concerning you. The encouragement, like Pastor Jim talked about last week, if you didn't get a hold of those messages, I want to encourage you, grab the CD or go online and listen or watch it online. You need to hear those encouragements from God and the maturity of the Word of God. But today we're going to move on in that encouragement to look at things that accompany salvation. The title of this morning's message is simply put, Things That Accompany Salvation. And now as the author of Hebrews was clearly speaking here to those who are within the family by giving that precept or that pre that, that thought of beloved, here we're talking about those who are in the body of Christ. Now you say, man, Pastor Luke, I don't know or I haven't done that yet. That's okay. We're going to give you that opportunity today. But as we do, I want to discuss something here. We're talking about things that accompany, that come along with, that are a part of salvation. Now in this subject, it's a huge subject. There are literally 
thousands of things we could discuss. And each of these things we could spend weeks in series on in discussing, but we don't have time for that, so we have to just scratch the surface on a few important things. Now, I want to say these are things that accompany salvation, which means that when you come into the kingdom of God through the grace of God and salvation, these are things that come alongside of your salvation, which means, listen, listen to me, get this, which means that you have these things, not that you can have these things, that you have these things. These are a part of your salvation. Whether or not you want to grab a hold of them, whether or not you want to apply them or live in them is your choice, but they are things that accompany or come alongside of your salvation. So you all understand that? We all on the same page today? So simply put, we're going to make this statement. Things that accompany our salvation, and we're going to talk about four things. Now, of these four things, remember I said there are literally thousands, but of these four, these are four key and elemental things that accompany our salvation. And each one of these, literally, we could spend weeks on in series, not just a single sermon, but literally we could spend series on, but we're not going to do that. We're just going to scratch the surface. But I believe the Holy Spirit's going to speak to you. He's going to encourage you. You're going to leave this place ready to go and to do what God has called you to do. And I'm excited for what God's got in store for you. So today... As we look at the subject of things that accompany salvation, let's get right into it. First one for this morning and things that accompany salvation, number one for this morning is grace. Hallelujah, the grace of God is something that accompanies our salvation. Now, <coughs> excuse me, before I go any further, let me say this. That grace not only accompanies our salvation, but grace preceded our salvation. What that means is that before you and I even realized we had need of a Savior, before we were even born, before we were even a thought in our parents' eyes, before we had even realized the need for salvation, the grace of God had already come and laid the groundwork through Jesus Christ for us to find salvation. The Bible tells us that it's by grace through faith we are saved. So you see the grace of God has come before our salvation and laid the groundwork for us to be in the family of God. We call this saving grace. God's saving grace. But today we're talking about things that accompany salvation. And you see, we don't just stop at the saving grace. God's saving grace is what brings us into the family of God. But now that we are in the family of God, the Bible talks about the manifold grace of God or the multifaceted face of, a grace of God, which means when you look at a diamond, there are many facets and many areas and many cuts, and each one reflects light in a different way. And the grace of God is the same way. There are many types and many forms of the grace of God in our life. Now, the saving grace of God is what brought us to salvation, but it has never been or never will be God's intent. Listen here now. It is never God's intent for us to come to salvation by faith and to stay the way we are because the grace of God allows us. But rather, the grace of God empowers us to become who God has called us to be, to look how God has called us to look, to act how God has called us to act, to reflect the gospel of Jesus Christ in our lives. So the grace of God brings us to salvation, but it also empowers us and allows us to get through life the way God would have us to get through life. So grace is not something that stops at salvation, but rather now it kicks into high gear for you and I. What an amazing concept, this subject of grace. I wish we had more time, but today we only have time to just scratch the surface. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. Go with me to 2 Corinthians in the 12th chapter. Here Paul the Apostle is speaking about a subject. And as you're turning, let me describe this subject. 2 Corinthians in the 12th chapter, Paul is discussing the subject that you and I see in our headings in our Bible called the thorn in the flesh. Now... Unless you're a gardener or a botanist or somebody who spends a great amount of time with plants, very rarely do you and I have thorns in our flesh. But I think everybody can relate to the idea or the thought of a splinter in the flesh. If you've ever had that little shard of wood or metal or plastic or something of that nature go into your skin, you know the moment you have a splinter because it's an irritant. It hurts. It's painful. And you know that you have to grab the tweezers or the needle or you have to soak it in water until it, until it comes out, until the skin becomes pliable. It's something that is a constant reminder of, of, of it being in there. You don't forget about it being in there. And so here Paul talks about this subject of the thorn in the flesh. And in 2 Corinthians in the 12th chapter, 
Verse number 7, Paul begun, begins to say, And least I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations. Listen, hold on right there. Paul the Apostle is making a statement. He's saying, I recognize something about my life. I recognize that God has a special calling on my life. I have been given, Paul says, an abundance of revelation. You see, Paul understood that he was a person of notoriety. You and I would say it like this, he is a person of fame. Where Paul went, people knew who he was. Why? Because Paul was not just somebody who proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ, but rather God used Paul as an instrument to literally lay the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the church that would carry out through the millennia. And so Paul understands that he has been given a great responsibility and great revelation. And because of that, he has gained notoriety. And with notoriety or fame might come pride. So Paul says, lest I be exalted above measure because of the revelations that have been given to me, a thorn in the flesh or a splinter was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. So Paul says literally, in order to keep my pride from growing, a messenger of Satan has been given to me to buffet me. Let's talk about this word for a moment, buffet. Now let's think about it like this. Let me explain it to you with this visual illustration. If you've ever been to the ocean or if you've ever been to a river before, you see the rocks that are in the river or the rocks that are in the ocean and you know that they fall off a mountain or they find their way into the riverbed or into the stream and they wash into the ocean. And what happens is, is the waves continually pound against the water or the rocks, the water continually buffets against that rock. It just hits it and hits it and hits it. The waves continually churn it. The waterfalls continually rub against it. And what it begins to do, You've seen these rocks before. It knocks the hard edges off of it. It begins to smooth and, 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 and make that rock smooth and, and, and circular or, or, or rounded. And that's what buffeting is, is it's something that comes and it continually rubs and it rubs and it grinds and it pulls you down and it takes those edges off. And so here Paul the Apostle says, a messenger of Satan has been given to him to buffet, to continually come against him, to rub against him, to grind against him, to take those edges off. Now let me tell you something. I don't know where you're at in your own life. You know that between you and God. But I can say that I know that at periods of your life you're going to have situations where things are going to buffet you. They're going to come against you. They're going to rub you. It might be an employer or an employee or a co-worker. It might be a family member or a child or somebody that you know. It might be something going on in your life with your finances or with your job or, or whatever it might be. There are things in our lives that will continually buffet us or rub against us. Now look what Paul begins to say in verse number 8. Verse number 8, Paul says concerning this thing, I pleaded, not just simply saying God, but rather I pleaded, went before God on his knees, Lord, three times that it might depart from me. Oftentimes in our life, the things that rub us, the things that, that break the edges off, the things that try to grind against us, oftentimes what we want to do is we want to flee or flight away from that. And there is a time and a place for that, definitely. I don't want to say as a blanket statement that we need to hold things out, much like Joseph in the house of Potiphar when he fleed or when he ran from Potiphar's wife. There is a time to get up and leave the things that are coming against you. But there are situations in our life when we can't simply do the easy thing, which is to get up and quit or to get up and leave. For example, maybe it is that that thing buffeting you is the person sitting next to you right now. Don't look at them, look straight ahead. But you can't just get up and leave. Why? Because hey, if you're married, that's the easy way out. But that's not God's way out. And so Paul says, I pleaded with God that this thing that's coming against me would be removed from me. Lord, take it away from me. But look at Christ's response to Paul. Verse number 9, and he, Jesus Christ, said to me, words of Christ and read in our Bibles, my grace is sufficient for you, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, Paul says, I would rather boast in my infirmities than the power of Christ may rest upon me. 
So here, instead of running, instead of burying his head in the sand, instead of having it being removed, Jesus comes to Paul and says, listen, this is something that will continually come against you, but don't fret. Why? Because your pride won't be, you won't base your pride on your own abilities, but rather, he says, I would rather boast in my infirmities. Why? That the Christ might be glorified. You see, so the grace of God will come in on your life. The grace of God will allow you to do what God has called you to do, allow you to get through those hard times and those good times in life because God's grace comes alongside of you when you come into the, the, the family of God through salvation. Now the grace of God accompanies you and will empower you to get through life the way God has called you to do and the way God has called you to be. You don't have to remain the same. You no longer have to be how you once were because the grace of God now comes alongside of you. And if we define it here at the church is God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. Hey, we can't do it, but that's fine. God's grace is sufficient for you and I today. So today, when there's hard times, when there's things that are rubbing you, take joy in knowing that God's grace is beside you and that when you feel like you can't do it, by the grace of God, His divine ability to do it when you can't, yeah, you can't, but God alongside of you can, and you will get through it. Amen? Amen. Paul goes on to say, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs, persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak... Then I am strong. Paul's saying, listen, something stopped me from getting prideful. And the last statement is the most opposite of pride you can look at right there. And he says, when I am weak, when I am in my lowest, that's when I'm in my strongest. Why? Because it's not my power. It's not my ability. It's not my nature. It's not my ability to do this. But rather, it is God's grace empowering and working through me that allows me to become who God has called me to be. Are you here today? So we're talking about things that accompany salvation. The grace of God is something that will empower you and I to become like Christ and to get through those situations in life. We're talking about things that accompany salvation. Number two for this morning, things that accompany salvation is belonging. Is belonging. You see, it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter if you grew up in a family where you had both parents, where they loved you where they took care of you, where they provided for you, where you had everything that you needed, or if you grew up where you didn't have parents at all, or you didn't have a dad, or you didn't have a mom, or you didn't grow up with anything, or you grew up in a hard life. You see, none of that matters anymore because when you come into the family of God with salvation, you come into an entirely new identity. No longer are you who you once were, but now you are who God says you are. So it doesn't matter where you came from. Now it matters where you're going and you have a sense of belonging with God through Jesus Christ. Amen. So the Bible, you or you've heard it said before, I shouldn't say the Bible, but you've heard this said before that we all want somebody to love us. We all just want to be loved. There's a song, all we need is love. Guess what? Whether or not all your life you've had it or you haven't, when you come into salvation in the body of Christ, guess what you have? You have the love of God the Father upon you. You have a belonging. You have a new identity in Jesus Christ that is far above and beyond what you could have ever imagined in your life. Look what the Bible says in Romans, the 8th chapter. Go with me really quickly to Romans in the 8th chapter. A few pages back, Romans in the 8th chapter. Verse number 16, the Bible tells us, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit. I love that. The Spirit Himself. This is God speaking to you directly, bearing witness that what? You are children of God. You know, there have been times in my life when I've messed up in sin or when I've messed up in struggle, and I look to my wife, I've said to my wife before, geez, I wonder if I'm ever even really saved. And here the, the fact is, is that the Spirit of God comes in and says to me, comes in and says to my spirit, regardless of what my flesh says, regardless of what the devil tries to tell me and lie to me about. Remember the Bible says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Regardless of what the circumstances of those around me might say, the Spirit of God comes to me and says, you are in the family. We are children of God. 
But I love how he doesn't just stop by saying we are children of God. Look what he goes on to say in verse number 17. And if children, I love this, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may be also be glorified. Yeah, guess what? You might have some hard times because of your family name, but you're going to have some great seasons in life because of your family name. And I love the fact that the Bible tells us that we are heirs. Do you know what heirs are? They get an inheritance. Hallelujah. Guess what? Because the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, you don't got to wait for your daddy to die to get your inheritance. You get it the moment you come into the family. The blessings of God. Hallelujah. You get a sense of belonging that comes with your salvation. You see, before you came into salvation, and again, remember, if you haven't had that opportunity yet, we'll give you that opportunity in a few minutes. But before you came into salvation, it, you were incapable, listen now, you were incapable of knowing God. You see, when God created Adam and Eve, they were perfect. They were in a one relationship with God. They communicated directly with God. But as soon as Eve partook of the fruit, she gave it to her husband Adam, and Adam partook of the fruit, something happened within them, and the sin nature came out, and they were disconnected with God. And God and man are on two completely different planes. It's much like this. Let me use a figure of authority. The president. I know who the president is. I know where he lives. I know his job. I know, I know, I know a lot about him. I can go online and I can know very, I know a great deal of information about the president. But that does not mean that I know the president. That does not mean that the president calls me up on my phone and asks me to come to dinner at his house and play basketball with him on his basketball court. You see, there's a difference between knowing who somebody is and knowing somebody. But with salvation, the Holy Spirit comes upon you and now God lives inside of you. And now all of a sudden you go from knowing who God is to now having a personal relationship with God. And through the Holy Spirit, you now know God personally and have direct access to him. What an amazing feature that you and I have. What an amazing benefit of salvation that we go from a place of knowing who somebody is or who God is to now knowing God on a personal level. Wow. Amazing. I love Ephesians just says, I'll just put it up on the overhead. We're no longer strangers, but now fellow citizens and saints and members of the household of God. Children, heirs, the Bible says, citizens, saints, members. Each one of those descriptions comes with a benefit. There are benefits to being in the family of God, and that is to be connected and united and to know the creator God, the creator of all things, the one who knows all things. You have an amazing source right there in front of you now, connected to you in your sense of belonging. We're talking about things today, about things that accompany our salvation. The third one for this morning on things that accompany our salvation is purpose. Yeah. A purpose. Maybe you've been in this position in your life. I know that I have many times in life cried out to God and said, God, why am I here? What did you put me here for? You might even recall the opening scene to that popular movie back in the 90s, Forrest Gump. Do you remember the, the slow-moving music and the feather? Do you remember the feather as it was floating around and the wind would change its direction and it was kind of floating through life? You see, that was a metaphor or a symbol of Forrest Gump's life. He was just kind of floating through life. He just happened to be at the right place at the right time or at the wrong place at the wrong time. Just kind of floating through life. Well, guess what? When you come into the body of Christ, when you come into the family of God, you no longer are a feather floating on the wind of life or just trying to exist to get together with somebody and have 2.5 kids live in a house with a white picket fence and live the American dream. But now you have a purpose, a reason for living. Yeah. Think about it like this. When the grace of God came and plucked you out of sin and death, brought you from the fires of hell now to an eternity with Jesus Christ and your family with God. Now at that moment, you realize the importance of your purpose. Why? Because if it was important enough for you, it's important enough for the people around you to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
I love what St. Francis of Assisi said. He said, preach the gospel at all times. And when necessary, use words. You see, our purpose in life is to be a reflection of Jesus Christ. Yes, we were all fallen short of the glory of God. And that's where the grace of God that comes through and it propels us to become like Jesus Christ and changes us and molds us. And people begin to look at us and say, what is it about you that is different? And you can begin to say, let me tell you what it is and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. James in the first chapter, I'll just put it on the overhead, says... Verse number 27, pure and undefiled religion. Uh Uh-oh, it's that dirty word. Pastor Luke, I'm not into that religion thing. I'm into the relationship thing. Pure and undefiled religion before God is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world, to visit those who are in their time of need, to keep yourself holy and righteous around from the world and before God through the grace of God I love what Martin Luther King Jr. said Martin Luther King Jr. said everybody can be great because anybody can serve everybody can be great because anybody can serve did you know that you are influential people Did you know that you are a people of influence? That God has placed you in unique relationships within your family, within your businesses, within your walks of your life, that you are influential into somebody's life. And imagine the the, the eternal ramifications for you sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just in word, but in your life, to now all of a sudden that person sees the grace of God and now has been removed from the fires of hell and they begin to share. You see, it's the greatest pyramid scheme in the history of the world, but it's a good one. God has called you to be influential people. You see, we serve not because of our love for people. Listen, you drove on the freeway to get here. You know what love for people feels like when somebody's cutting you off. We don't serve because of our love for people. People sometimes can be very hard to love. I love what John Wayne says, life is hard, but it's harder when you're stupid. (laughs) People can be difficult to love. We don't serve because of our love for people. We serve because of our love for God and His love for people. And we love the things that God loves. Amen? If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew, the 25th chapter. Look what Jesus says. Matthew, the 25th chapter, as we move along. Matthew, the 25th chapter, amazing verses. I remember we had this in our old church, painted up on the wall in one of our multi-purpose rooms. Matthew, the 25th chapter, verse number 35, verse number 34, excuse me. The king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit. Remember that inheritance we were talking about being children of God. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why? Verse number 35, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Verse number 37 goes on to say, the righteous will come and answer to him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Verse number 40 goes on to say, And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. You see, our ministry is never to be designed to do it for God, but our ministry is designed to do it with God. The grace of God comes in. The identity of God comes in and propels us and gives us the purpose now to get out there and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, when you did it to the least of these brethren, it's just as much as if you did it to me personally. And it is our purpose in life to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you with me this morning? Can you, can you handle one more? Can we talk about one more thing that accompanies salvation this morning? Last one for this morning, things that accompany salvation. Number four this morning, power. Power. I love that. 
I'm going to say something. Some of you are going to look at me like, Pastor Luke, where are you going? But I'm going to say the comment and then I'll explain it. I love what Peter Parker's uncle tells him in Spider-Man. You're like, Pastor Luke, really? You just brought Spider-Man to church? You might even remember if you ever saw the, the, the first Spider-Man. He says to him, with great power comes great responsibility. Man, Stan Lee knew something about it. Listen, here's the deal. When you come into the family of God through salvation, you have something in your life that you did not have, and that is the power of God beside you, backing you, getting you through life. With great power comes great responsibility, which means you have the decision whether or not you're going to recognize you've got power of God in your life or you don't. It's your choice. But you have a power that comes alongside. You see, the grace of God enables you to get through life. We talked about that. The grace of God enables you to get through life and to be who God has called you to be. Listen to this now. The power of God comes in and exponentially increases the effectiveness of your life. Let me say that one more time. The grace of God enables us to get through life. The power of God comes and not just increases, but exponentially increases your effectiveness in life. You can go and live your life knowing that, guess what? It's not me that does it, but it's the power of Christ that speaks through me. And now all of a sudden, the things that I could not do, I can now do. That's why Paul the Apostle said that through Christ... All things are possible that I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me because now you've got something that you did not have. You got the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit alongside of you. Come on, somebody. Wow. Staring at me like a cow at a new gate. Stanley Jones says, if the Holy Spirit can take over the subconscious with our consent and cooperation, then we have the almighty power working in the base of our lives. We can do anything we ought to, go anywhere we ought to, and be anything we ought to. You can do anything, go anywhere, and be anything because the power of God is upon your life with salvation, and now you've got something that you didn't have before. I love what Jesus says in Acts, the first chapter, as he talks to his disciples. He says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be witnesses in me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, listen, when you get salvation, we talked about this with identity, you get the Holy Spirit. And now through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, now you get this power of God. And look what it says in Acts, the fourth chapter, about these disciples. It says, with great power, the, the apostles gave witnesses to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus wasn't just talking. He backed it up. You have got power that you don't recognize, and all you have to do is apply it to your life. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you. Listen, you may not be somebody who talks well. You may not be somebody who reads well. You may not be somebody who's very smart. You may not be somebody who has a lot of influence. But now it doesn't matter what you have or what your physical ability is. Why? Because the grace of God covers that. But now the power of the Holy Spirit comes and says, I will fill your mouth. Open it and I'll use it. The power of God in our lives. Amazing, amazing concept. You get to put your head up. Put your shoulders back and realize the Bible tells us that greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. You know what you get to do? You get to leave church today with your head held high, your shoulders back and say, I got the power. But you got to apply it. You got to live it. You got to use it. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. You don't use it, you don't get it. Love what A.W. Tozer said about the church condition. If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, not just not the rock, the church in general, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. But listen to this. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. 
Church, could you imagine what we would look like if we understood the fact that the power of the Holy Spirit is within each and every one of us upon salvation and all we have to do is put our faith and our trust in God and allow Him to lead us and allow Him to use us and to see the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. Look what Jesus tells His disciples in John the 14th chapter. I love this. Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than he's will he do. Why? Because I go to my Father. Jesus said to his disciples, I can't stick around on earth all the time. i got to go do my business in heaven. I've laid the foundation. Now it's time for you to carry or pick up where I left off and start doing what I started doing. And he says, I'm not going to leave you alone, but rather the helper, the Holy Spirit will come upon. And because of that, greater things. You know what that means, church? For you, greater things in your life. God has got a design for you to be a people of great things, signs, wonders, miracles, the oracles of God to be spoken, to get out there and to do something with the kingdom of God because that is God's intent. The things that Jesus did, you can read the word of God and say, man, I wish I could do that. No, Jesus says you're going to do better than that. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is on you and you have got the power of God in your life. Wow! So you get to pick your head up, put your shoulders back when you go to work tomorrow and something's going to buffet you. You know, the Bible says be sober, be vigilant. The, the enemy walks around like a lion, roaring, seeking whom he may devour. Well, that's a pretty scary picture. Guess what? God has given you through the power of the Holy Spirit a really big stick. And when that lion try to come at you, you swing that stick and knock that lion out because nothing... No weapon formed against you is going to prosper. Jesus said you can trample over snakes and scorpions and nothing by any means shall harm you. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty. Why? Because you got the power. <laughs> Hallelujah. The grace of God, number one today, accompanies our salvation, doesn't just precede us, but it now allows us, empowers us to become who God has called us to be. No, it's not God's intent for us to stay the same but rather to use the grace of God to become like God. Secondly, we have a new identity. No longer do we go from knowing who God is, but now we know who. Now we know God personally. On a one-on-one -on -one level, we can talk to and communicate with God through our new identity because we are heirs and heirs in Christ Jesus. We have an inheritance. Number three, you're not floating around in life existing anymore, but now you've got a purpose. Get out there and do it, but don't do it on your own. Use the power, number four, of the Holy Spirit to come and speak through you and move through you and be effective in what you do and everything you do and see and watch God do something in your life. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord today? <laughs> Praise God. Hey, It would be a travesty for me to not talk about or give you the, uh, the option or the, the, the opportunity, I should say, to examine your heart, especially on a day like today when we, sp when we spoke about things that accompany salvation. I want to ask you this question. If you were to leave today and you were to die, heaven forbid, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a relatively simple question, but let's examine those answers. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can get to heaven because you think you're going to go? because you want to go, or because you hope you're going to get to heaven, you might say, oh, I hope I go to heaven. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you can hope, think, or want your way into heaven. You can't get there that way. You know, nowhere in the Bible does it tell you, or does it tell me that we could get to heaven because we weren't raised as a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim or any other type of world religion, so that I guess by classification or by default that means we're going to get to heaven. You can't get to heaven by default or by classification. You can't get there that way. You might say, well, Pastor Luke, my parents took me to church as a kid. I went to Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes. I was baptized or christened as a baby. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you were baptized or christened as a baby, that because you attended church on Christmas and on Easter with your family, or because your parents told you that you were a Christian, mean that you're going to get into heaven? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. You know, you might even say, well, Pastor Luke, all my life I've professed to be a Christian. I've given myself that title. I'm a Christian. We oftentimes do this. We say, I'm a Christian, but I, or I believe this, but I'm a Christian. 
The fact of the matter is, is that you can't give yourself a title of Christian and believe that you're going to get into heaven. That's like going into your garage and calling yourself a car. I'm a car, I'm a car, I'm a car. At no point, because you've given yourself the title of car, are you going to ever be a car. Just because you call yourself a Christian or you profess to be one means that you're going to get to heaven. Nowhere will you find that. You won't find that in the Word of God. You can't get to heaven because you've given yourself a title. You say, Pastor Luke, I'm a good person. Good people go to heaven. I've never cheated on my taxes. I do good deeds. I don't drive too fast on the roads. I even give to charitable organizations. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get to heaven? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that good people are going to get to heaven? As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that according to God's righteousness, our good deeds or our good works are like filthy rags. Nowhere can you find in the Word of God that you're going to get to heaven because you're a good person, because you do good things not saved by your works. I'm sorry to tell you that. You might say, well, but Pastor Luke, I was a, a children's ministry worker. I served in the youth ministry. I sang in the choir. I carried the pastor's Bible as an usher. I have a card in my wallet that says I'm a member to a church. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Did you know that nowhere does it say that because you served in a church, because you served in your children's or youth ministry, because you sang in the choir, you carried the pastor's Bible as an usher, because you've got a card in your wallet that means you're a member of a church? Did you know nowhere in the Bible does that mean or does that, will you find that you're going to get to heaven? You can't get to heaven that way. I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough to tell you the truth. You can't do that. The reality is that you can't get to heaven any other way but God's way. Why? Because it's God's heaven. The only way to get to God's heaven is God's way. And Jesus Christ, speaking to a religious leader of his time, in John the third chapter, has a discussion about this. And let me tell you a little bit about this religious leader named Nicodemus in John the third chapter. Nicodemus memorized the scripture. Nicodemus gave to the poor. He wore, wore all the right clothes. He said all the right things, did all the right things. You would think that Jesus would come to Nicodemus and pat him on the back and say, man, you just keep on going. But Jesus says to Nicodemus, here it is, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, man, he's talking about that weirdo, crazy, out of control Christianity. But listen, I don't care what Hollywood, popular culture, society, sitcoms that have made out of the term born again. They have no concept of God. But from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, in God's eyes, it's always meant the same thing. Ready? It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. There it is. The only way to heaven. Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. And God's after an all or nothing relationship with him. Let me prove it to you in the Bible. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church. The church. People like us. And he says, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow. Shocking, rude, crude statement from the mouth of Jesus Christ. And what he is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does that mean, lukewarm, in terms of your relationship? Let's define that. It means that you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out, you're a little bit up, you're a little bit down. Occasional church attendance, a token prayer here and again, doing some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You're not wholehearted for God, but you're not wholehearted against God. You're riding the fence right down the middle. And Jesus Christ says, if that's who you're deceived in thinking, you're going to make it into heaven. Listen, I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough today to be in your face about it, to tell you the truth that you can't get to heaven because you think you're going to get there, because you want to get there, because you believe so, because you've said that you're going to go. The only way you and I can get to heaven is God's way. You say, Pastor Luke, listen, I appreciate what you're doing. You find God your way, I'll find God my way. We'll all get there to the same. You know, that's like saying all roads lead to the moon. I'm sorry, you can't get there your way, my way, or any other well-meaning church committee's way. The only way we can get there is God's way. Like I said, Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. Jesus Christ also said that if you confess him before men, he will confess you before his Father. But if you deny him before men, he will deny you before his Father. So today I want to give you the opportunity in just a moment to make the decision to go for God in your life. Here's what I'm going to do in just a moment. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three I'm going to go three. I'm going to smack my hand on my Bible just like that, real loud. And in a moment, I want to give you the opportunity. Here's what I want you to do when I smack my hand on the Bible. We'll do it all together, all at the same time, as I want you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to make sure I get to heaven. Pastor Luke, I want to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of my life. Pastor Luke, I want to go forward in my relationship with God. I will see your hand. I'm a man. You can put it right back down from there. Who should raise their hand in just a moment? If you've never given them all your heart, if you've never given them all your life, today is the day of your salvation. Today is the day 
that you come and see those things that accompany your salvation. Pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it. You put it right back down. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure? In a moment, pop your hand up. Make sure, don't leave this place without making sure. Maybe you did this as a child or earlier in your life at a Harvest or Billy Graham crusade, but you never really followed through. Today, make it the day you go forward and follow through with your commitment for Jesus Christ and give him your heart and give him your life and ensure your place in heaven. Finally, who should raise their hand if you've been living lukewarm? doing your own thing instead of God's thing. If you've been running from God instead of to God today, make it the day you go hot in your relationship with Jesus Christ and ensure your place with God in heaven for eternity, leaving hell behind forever and ever and ever. It was never designed for you. It's designed for the devil and his demons. Don't buy into the lie that you can get there your way. Let's do it God's way today. You say, Pastor Luke, if I put my hand up, I'm going to be embarrassed. Somebody's going to see me. You know what? You might be. But get over it for a moment. Why? Because wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward for God in a warm, welcome, and loving place like the church? You see, God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. He's given you every opportunity by giving his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess, to hang on the cross for your sins so that you could give him all your heart. You can give him all your life in return. The decision's yours. Nobody can make it for you. Today is the day of your salvation. Don't wait another day. Don't leave this place without making sure. Hey, listen, some of you have come into this place and said day in and day out, I need to get my, right, my life together. I need to get right. I need to stop playing around. Listen, today is the day to stop playing around with God and let's go forward in your relationship with God. Don't wait another moment. The time of your salvation is now. I'm gonna count to three. If that's you, get ready. Hands are gonna go up all over this auditorium. If you're watching online, or in the, in the Love Rock Cafe or in the foyer, wherever you're at, stop what you're doing. You put your hand up right where you're at. Grab an usher or somebody like that. Tell them what you did and they'll bring you up or they'll, they'll tell you what to do from there. And the moment of your salvation is here. Here we go. I'm going to count. Get ready. All over this auditorium. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. I see you. One, I see you. Where are you at? Come on, let me see. Three, I see you right there. Three wise people. Where I see some hands. But give me a little wave. Four, I see you back there. Anybody else in the family room? Five, I see you. Where are you at? Five, let me just see your hand. If anybody else, I saw that hand back there. Five wise people. Six, seven, I see you right there. Eight, I see you right there. Eight wise people. Anybody else in this place? Let me see your hand tonight or this morning. Let me see your hand. In the family room's over there. Nine wise people. Where are you at? Ten, I see you right there. Ten wise people. I know that there's more than that. I know that there's more in this place. You're saying, I wonder if I should. Come on, get your hand up. Let's go forward for God. I see ushers pointing over in this direction. Where are we at? Let me see your hand. I saw that hand in the, in the family room already. Another one? Is there one or two? I saw that hand. Nine wise people. Anybody else in this place today? Where are you at? I see that hand right there. Anybody else in this place today? Everybody's pointing over. I see that hand right there. I got you. 10, 11. Where are you at? Number 13, number 14, number 15. Come on, you're saying, I wonder if I should quit playing games with God. You said in your heart, I need to start taking this seriously. Today the day to take it seriously. Anybody else in this place today? Come on, where are you at? Don't let this opportunity pass you by. Come on, where are you at in this place today? Anybody else? 11 or 12 people in this place already. Come on, I didn't embarrass them. I'm not going to embarrass you. Anybody else today? I'm going to close this up right now. Well, praise God for the 11 or 12 people. Hallelujah. Here's what we're going to do in a moment. We're all going to stand together, sing a song. If you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand. You said you're serious about giving Jesus Christ. Remember, you don't give him your heart. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You say, I want to get saved by raising my hand. So if you raise your hand or you're serious about this or you didn't raise your hand, it's not too late. In a moment, we're all going to stand together. As we stand, please nobody leave. But if you raise your hand and you're serious about this, I want you to be bold. Grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend. If you need a friend, somebody came with you, grab them, come up and get out of your seat, get out of your chair and come meet me up here at the altar and let's change destinies together. You said you're going to give him your heart. Let us help you today. Let's all stand together. Please nobody leave from the family rooms, from the front to the back, wherever you're at. Come on, you come. Let's change destinies together. Come on. If that's you, you come. Come on, wherever you're at. You come. Come on. Come on, from the back, from the front, wherever you're at, get out of your seat, get out of your chair, come on. Oh, they're still coming, we'll wait, we'll wait.
that's you, it's not too late. Come on, you get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come on. Well, praise God. Listen, not everybody who raised their hands came. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You need to understand that. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to get in, come into your heart, come into your life, and be your Lord and Savior. Let us help you today. If that's you, you come. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. We will wait for you. It's not about a tradition. It's about getting into God today. Come on, if that's you, you're serious about that. If you should have done it, listen, I'm going to wait for you. I'll hold this whole service up for you. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair and come meet me up here today. Let's change destinies together. If that's you, come on. I know you're in this place. You say, man, I wish I, I should, I should, I should. You need to get out and do this. Come on. If that's you in this place today, we'll wait for you. Where are you at in this place today? You say, Pastor, look, this is awkward. This is weird. Yep. But you're worth it. Come on. You're worth it. Anybody else in this place today? If that's you, come on. The Spirit of God's tugging on your heart. Don't, don't resist it. Let's go. That's you. Come on. Come on. Saying, I wonder if I should, Pastor Luke, I wonder if I should get up there. Get up there. Get up there. Come on. The decision's yours. Anybody else in this place today, you're going to make that decision? Well, praise God, guys. You came. Hallelujah. Hey, today, you're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Here's what I want to do. This is my friend right over here. This is Pastor Dan. Pastor Dan's one of the coolest guys you're ever going to meet. One of the nicest guys. He's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to lead you in your prayer. He's going to give you some free information. He's going to give you a friend here at the Rock Church to help you get strong in the word and the ways of God so that you grow strong. You don't go back to the life that you came from. So if you guys would just turn to your right, my left, go right over there with Pastor Dan. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.